I, I will put up the ninth problem set later today. It'll be due on Friday. So same problem as last week. Uh, doing class time on Friday. Sorry about that. And anyway, okay, so today, today I will try to do start to finish, well, air conditioners, the story of air conditioners. And I'll remind you that, that, that where these sort of enter, our, enter the picture is these are sophisticated air conditioners and automobiles, sophisticated devices that, that manipulate heat uh, in a way that, that just simple wood stoves and such don't. They're, the air conditioner is an example of a heat pump. It uses order, order really, but often ordered energy to move heat the wrong way, from cold to hot, the way it doesn't naturally flow. And I hope it, you're comfortable with the idea that when I say it's the wrong way, it's the way that nature doesn't do naturally. It's statistically not going to happen, but you can force it to happen if you're willing to consume order. So that's the heat pump. The heat engines of the world, which an automobile is an example of, uses the order that's present in, in, in thermal systems that have different temperatures. It uses the fact that, that, that if, there, if you have two objects with different temperatures, there is some order there. And you can use that strategically to convert some of the thermal energy in this system into work, to undo the disordering. Uh, you do it at the expense of creating more disorder, so it's not a free, no free lunch. But um, it, it manages to make use of heat and thermal energy in a way that normal objects can't. OK, so, so back to air conditioners, the, the, the basic uh, foundation on which to build the, the, the Three of the four so-called laws of thermodynamics. I'll remind you of, of, of the three, and then I'll dwell on the third for, for adequately, hopefully. The first one is just the law of thermal equilibrium. The idea that if you have three objects, three boxes, and uh, box A and B, when you touch them, no heat flows, which says they're in, they're in thermal equilibrium. And you touch box B and C and no heat flows, which says they're in thermal equilibrium, you know for sure that box A and C, when you touch them, no heat flows. They are also in thermal equilibrium. And although this seems like a trivial notion, this, this idea that, you, that, that if you've got three, three objects that don't, any two of them don't pay, share heat between the, well, any, any two pairs, the third doesn't share heat either or exchange heat, it's, it's the basis for the whole concept of temperature. Without it, you wouldn't have, temperature wouldn't have any meaning because you couldn't predict in advance if you touched any two objects together based on some number you knew, whether, they, whether he would flow from the left one to the right one or right one to the left one. It would, be, it would be chaos. So it does turn out that, that our world has the concept of temperature. Our, our universe allows the concept of temperature. And heat does flow naturally from hotter objects by temperature to colder objects by temperature. So the whole, all these temperature scales are just fleshing out that idea. Um, so that's the first, first of the laws of thermodynamics to point out. The second one to remind you of has a complicated way of, of being stated officially. A simple way of stating it officially, semi-officially, is that if you have an object, you can add heat to that object. Sorry, you can add energy to that object in two different ways. You can do work on the object, or you can let heat flow to, to that object, or you can send heat to that object. The point of this law and the value of this law is it recognizes that heat is a form of energy it, on, on a par with work. Um, so early in the semester, I talked about how, how do you give something energy? You do work on it, right? And I, I would sometimes throw in the mechanical way of giving it energy just because I was trying to be uh, officially correct. There is a second way to give it energy. Send heat into it, OK? And again, that wasn't, it wasn't you know, maybe obvious now, but it wasn't obvious 100, you know, 200 years ago. What, what is heat? Nobody really knew. It turns out it's just good old-fashioned energy, but chopped up into little pieces that are harder to work with. OK, the third law, is, you OK with that? Questions? Any questions coming in? No. OK, the, the last laws of thermodynamics to, to talk about is, is sort of the most important in this, certainly for, for us now. It's called the law of entropy. And it makes an observation 
that in a thermally isolated system, and I'll come back again to that, to why the thermally isolated. So it, just for, for now, just worry that it's just some little island in the middle of nothing else. The entropy of that system never decreases. So, okay, that, that begs a zillion questions. First off is what's entropy? Entropy is the measure of the disorder in some object. It's a quantifiable amount. It's a physical quantity. You can actually go into this, uh, this controller here, and in principle, you can figure out and, and assign a, a, a quantitative number to how much disorder it has. That will be its personal entropy. And you'd have to, you know, it's, it's complicated to get there, but, it, but, but everyone would agree on what that entropy is. It, entropy has units, in fact. So assuming we pick the same units, come, people would come up with the same value for, for an object. So it's a, it's a physical quantity. It is not a conserved physical quantity. It's, it is the measure of the disorder of that thing. If I take that thing and I smash it with a hammer, it's still there, and I do it, I do it in, in sort of isolation so, so no entropy is moving around. I can smash, I can make more entropy. So entropy is not a conserved quantity. It, it's unfortunate that the word entropy and the word energy sound so similar. There's some origin of these words that I don't know. Or maybe I learned one day a zillion years ago and I forget. It, it's unfortunate, but keep them, keep them separate. Energy is a conserved quantity in nature. You can't make it or destroy it. Entropy is not. You can make it to your heart's content. And actually, you do. You make lots of disorder everywhere. It's, it's unavoidable. It's not, you know, it's, there's no judgment in this. It's just like life. Life literally makes entropy. So. Um, you can always make more. What you can't do is make less. Once you've made it in an isolated system, you can't get, make less of it. What you can do if it's not an isolated system is you can export it. So you can make all the entropy you like in your, in your room, and then you can take all that entropy and throw it in the garbage dump. But you can't remove it from the universe. Once it's made, it's made. Okay. So, where does that apply to um, air conditioners? What we're going to see, what, what, I, what I want you to come away with un, uh, understanding is that what air conditioners do is they don't get rid of entropy. They move it around. And, and ultimately, they move it around. At the same time, they're moving thermal energy around. And Air, air conditioners ultimately actually create entropy as they have to. They can't, they can't make it go away. Uh, but they manage to strategically move thermal energy from one place to another and actually against its natural direction of flow, which is kind of remarkable. They do that, so they make, they make the cold room colder and the hot outdoors hotter. So that's the bottom line of an air conditioner running in the middle of the summer, is that your room gets colder and colder if you keep turning up the air conditioner. And the outdoors gets hotter and hotter. This is not normal I mean, in the sense that, that, that nature doesn't do this naturally. Heat flows the other way. In fact, heat will be flowing the other way unless you've got good insulation. The, the hot outdoor heat will come right roaring right back into your house, which is why you don't want to open the door. So um, the, the air conditioner does this, but it does this at the cost of ultimately of producing more entropy than, 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 than the world started with. So there's, again, no free lunch in this. Uh, the law of entropy is okay with this, allows it, it's permitted. So um, I, I quip in the book about you know, three ways of trying to cool your room. One of them is to take the thermal energy that's in your room, in the, in the air, room air, and destroy it from nature, gone from the universe. That violates the law of conservation, that violates the law of conservation of energy in the world of thermodynamics, but it actually, it, it, it violates the, the law of conservation, sorry, it violates conservation of energy. You can't do it. You can't make thermal energy just go. So that's part A. Part B is uh, you can't take this heat and expect it to flow naturally, the thermal energy is in your room, flow naturally to the outside. That would violate the law of entropy. It's a, it's a statistical problem. So, the air conditioner has to live within the law of entropy and still manage to move heat outside. Okay, so how does it do that? Well, 
to, to, still to, to build a few more tools for this, I want to describe a little bit how adding heat to things, well, I'll start, adding heat to things disorders them. So, I mean, what, what, what sorts of disorders are included in, in entropy? Any kind of disorder. So, if you take a crystal vase and you heat it up, you add thermal energy to it, its entropy goes up. If you take a crystal vase and smash it on the floor, its entropy goes up. If you take, uh, actually, if you take liquid water and dry air in a room and you allow them to mix, their entropy goes up. There's more disorder. You've lost track of where the, where the water is. Uh, where I want to head with this is, is to the, the adding of thermal energy to an object. How much does it disorder the object? So just to get your, get your mind focused on this for a second, let me ask you a question. I'll do this and you, let you guess. Uh, uh, <laughs> hopefully more than guess, but we'll see. If you, thermal energy, like all energy, can be measured in units. And the, 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 unit, the standard SI unit of energy is, is the joule, also known as the Newton meter, but, but given the, the, the short name joule, if you add one joule of thermal energy, which is a, a, a specific amount, not very much, to a cold object and to a hot object, so you've got, you got a choice. You can put one joule, one joule of thermal energy into each. Which do you think experiences the most increase in its disorder? You okay with the question? Okay, see what you think. A few more seconds here, let's go five, Four, three, two, one, zero. The colder object it is. That's, so that's right. So, so those of you who, got, who, who voted for B, pat yourselves on the back. Let me make, make it clear why that is, because there wasn't any great reason why you would know that except to, to anyway. Uh, the more order something has, the more fragile that order is, in effect. So to, to use one of my, my analogies, uh, your sock drawer again. Suppose your sock drawer could, could be a cold object, in which case it is all one color. Uh, that, that's the equivalent. It's, all, it's very orderly, simple. Cold objects are inherently orderly ones. They don't have much of the thermal energy that is associated with a partial cause of disorder. And a hot sock drawer would be equivalent to your, your, your total mixture. Well, I was doing blue and orange last time, so let me go to blue and orange again. So, you, so one drawer is just pure blue socks, and the other drawer is a mixture of blue and orange socks, randomly. That's the hot drawer. It's got, already got a lot of disorder in it. Which one do you think is most disordered if you go and grab three socks at random from the laundry basket of unknown color, you do it in the dark and you just throw them in? Which one is more disordered? Well, the perfectly orderly blue sock drawer is going to be more disordered because even one or two orange or three orange socks you throw in there by, by, by accident, it completely, now you, now you can't guarantee when you reach in there you're going to get a blue sock. Whereas the the mishmash drawer, you threw three socks at random, it looks the same, nothing happened. So you didn't really add much disorder to it at all. So I'll give you, you know, the, in the book I give you one other, well, one other analogy for this idea that, that, that I should summarize that and say that the, the amount of disorder in a system is when you, when you add a joule of heat to it, Depends on its initial temperature. One joule of heat added to a very cold object, which was very, very orderly, is seriously, that, that, that cold object is seriously disordered for the first time ever, in effect. It's suddenly got all this, this random thermal energy in it, and that 
change the situation from wonderfully orderly to just kind of like middling. Okay, you know, it's somewhat orderly, but it's now got all this thermal energy around it. Whereas adding one joule of thermal energy to a hot object barely affects it. It's already scrambly city, so you throw in a little more, who cares? And my, the, the book analogy, I, I, which I still like, I you know, do it anyway, is, is that you've got two parties going on. One of them is a, a, a three-year-old's birthday party, which is chaos, and one of them is a, uh, the garden party at the, uh, at the lawn somewhere here, over here, for, for octogenarians, and, which is extremely sedate and orderly. And you take a person at random off the street and send them in these two parties. I mean, which one is more, or a couple people, picked up at random, you throw them into the party, which one's more disordered? Well, the, the, the kid's birthday party, nothing much happens. Of course, the, the, the tea party and stuff, the garden party is seriously disrupted. So the more orderly something is, the more sensitive it is to the addition of disorder. And that ultimately will, 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 will set the stage for a lot of things. And I'll, let me flesh it out and show you the process, so, show you how it governs the flow of heat between things. That, that's that one notion, that a joule of heat is more disordering for a hot object than it is for a cold object. Watch what happens when we do this. So I'm going to put up a table up there for a sort of a cartoon, this, a, a story that's it's not a, a, a simulation of the real world, it's an approximation or, or a, it's a cartoon of the real world. And here's the idea. I have two objects which at present are, are as cold as they could possibly be. How, is, how, do you know, how do I know that? Well, I know that because they have dials on them that tell you how much thermal energy they have. And associated with that thermal energy, will let that thermal energy be the only source of disorder. Associated with that thermal energy is a, an amount of entropy, that is a, an amount of disorder. And the, as the thermal energy goes up, and with it the more crazy chaos in it, the entropy will go up as well. So the two, the two dials are going to track the same way. However, as you add the initial thermal energy to the box, its, its disorder will go up a lot for, for, for each joule you add, each unit, because you're starting with a cold object. So just to, to, to look at this, this uh, my chart up here on the wall. When there's no thermal energy in one of my objects, there's no entropy. It's, it's, it's as orderly as it'll ever get. If I add one joule of thermal energy to the object, or one unit of thermal energy to the object, because it's a very cold object, that, that unit of thermal energy is highly disordering. It causes four gigantic units of entropy to pop up. So that's why you got a four over there. I like the old, the old school pointer. OK, so, so that, first, that first unit of energy is highly disordering. The second unit of thermal energy you add disorders it more, but only by three units of increase. It's not as the, the, the object already has some disorder, so adding more thermal energy doesn't stir it up, mess it up as much, and so on. Three units, you get a, a thermal energy, you get, you get an additional increase in entry of two is you add the, the, the last of the units that, I, that I'm going to be worrying about, a thermal energy to the object, you, you only increase its entropy by one. You OK with the story so far? Questions about the story so far? OK. So watch what happens to these two objects. And, and I, should, I, I can also point out that the temperature of the objects is exactly proportional to how much thermal energy they have. That, that's, that, it doesn't always happen exactly in, in objects. Gases do it pretty well. You, you double the thermal energy in the gas, and you pretty much double its temperature. It's, you know, it's pretty close. And this tracking of entropy, and don't, it's, it, it's, it's not even an approximation. It's a, it's a choice, but, it's a, it, but it, it, it realizes how the real world works. It, it, does, it does match the real world. The actual increase in entropy caused by a certain addition of energy is complicated. It depends on the material and stuff. But the basic idea is sound all across. So let me start with two objects that are bitter cold. And from outside, I'm going to start adding thermal energy to the left object. I'll add one unit. Here it is, one unit. In it goes. And with that, of course, I have to, to increase 
the pointer saying how much thermal energy is in there by one, because I added one, and it's going into a cold object. So it, it bumps the thermal energy, sorry, the entropy up by four. It's woo, big, big jump in disorder for adding, adding the thermal energy. You, you, you suddenly added a, a, a three-year-old to the garden party, woo, craziness, okay? I'm now gonna add the second dose of thermal energy, and it goes two, I've got two in there now, and it adds disorder but not as much as before. Instead of going up by four units, I only go up by three units. So I'm matching that, my list up there. Just, that list is just in, in effect to remind you. Okay, and so the third unit, up it goes. Now we have three units of thermal energy and I increase the entropy by two. Not so much, just a little bit. And finally, it's, it's, it's now gotten, it's a pretty hot object now. It's got a lot of thermal energy in it. I'm gonna add one more, make it really hot, and the entropy goes up a little smidge. Right, there it is, okay. So, I now have a hot object, and I have a cold object, and I touch them. When I do that, I'll, I'll put away my, my external thermal energy and just start letting heat flow the natural way it wants to flow, which is, it turns out that heat wants, well, we'll see. We'll see from this that heat wants to flow from the hot one to the cold one. I'm going to take, clearly the cold one's got no heat, no thermal energy to work with. It's, it can't give the hot one thermal energy. Let's let the, the, the hot one, for some reason, give the cold one a dose of thermal energy. So it just, if it, if it, we put them in contact, in principle, the, the energy can begin to migrate. And, and there's no, the laws of, of, the mechanical laws of physics, the, the laws of motion don't dictate which way it migrates. It, it could try both directions. But watch what happens when it tries to go from the hot one to the cold one. Right now, let's tally up the total entropy we have in the system before I make the move. Right now, so I'll put it back. The total entropy in the system is 10 on the left, and these are, it's a real physical quantity, so there are 10 units of the real stuff, of, of entropy. And there are zero on the right. So we have a grand total of 10. So suppose some heat, so, and I'm being a little cavalier about heat, thermal energy. Uh, let's, well, I try to make thermal energy. Some thermal energy accidentally migrates from the hot one to the cold one, just because of things bumping around and poof, off it goes, woof, over it went. Well, now I got, I got to re reset four dials. First off, the left box lost an entire unit of thermal energy. It's down to three. And with it, the entropy, its entropy goes down to nine. It lost some of its en entropy. It exported the entropy. Okay? So, so it actually did become more orderly than it was. But, but there was a cost. Something else became disorderly. This guy on the right, which was bitter cold before, now has, has a, one unit of thermal energy in it that it didn't have before. And with that, since it was bitter cold, that's highly disordering. Its entropy leaps by four units. And so the overall, the, the, the total entropy of the system has increased. It's now nine plus four is 13. Three units of entropy appeared out of nowhere. Again, it's not a conserved quantity, so that's not a problem. It, we created more disorder. That movement of heat from the hot one to the cold one uh, inevitably creates additional disorder. And in fact, that's why heat flows from hot to cold naturally. When you touch a, a hot poker to a basin of water, I don't know, heat flows from the poker to the water, not, never the other way. Going the other way would reduce entropy, and it's forbidden by the law of entropy, which is, a, which is basically a statistical law. You have now, you suddenly won the lottery a, a trillion times in a row. No, it doesn't happen. So the heat flows from the hot poker to the cold water because that creates a lot of disorder. It's, it's statistically extremely likely. All the motion is gonna, it's, it's gonna happen. It's, it's equivalent to, uh, Many things, I won't do my, I won't, I'll stop with the analogies. Okay, let's move another, 
another, let's let another dose of thermal energy move around. You know that if I let a dose of thermal energy come out of this box and go over to that box to so go back from the cold one to the hot one, the way that, that, that you've noticed doesn't happen, we'll, be, we'll go back to 10 units of entropy. The entropy will drop, and that's forbidden. The law of entropy will be bitterly unhappy with that. So let's go the other way. Let a, let a, a dose of thermal energy leave the, the hot one. It's not, it's not as hot as before, but it's still hotter than the other one, so it's going to move over. Over it goes. And with that, I've got to move, again, all four of the no dials. I, I've lost a unit of thermal energy on the left, so it drops. Its temperature's going down. Its entropy goes from 9 to 7, a little bit of a, a bigger drop in entropy because heat came out of now a warm object, not out of a hot object. On the right-hand side, one unit of thermal energy showed up, and the temperature's gone up. And consequently, the disorder's gone up. It went from four. We had, we had three more units of entropy. There we are. We're at seven. Okay? Because that unit of thermal energy arriving disordered it, but not as much as when it was, when it was super cold. Okay? So now our entropy is at 14. We actually increased the entropy. We went, we went from 13, which was what, what was on the, on the dials, the previous story, now to 14. And you'll notice the temperatures, temperatures of the two objects are the same now. They've, they both have the same you know, amount of thermal energy. We're assuming the objects are the same. So they're, so they're at the same temperature. That turns out to be the maximum entropy they can have in this situation. If I move thermal energy either way now, from, from, from the left box to the right box, the right box to the left box, I will create a hotter one and a colder one out of, out of them being the same. And the entropy will go down. And the law of entropy says in a thermally isolated system, and I still need to sort of flesh out the thermally isolated more, but it, in, in this sort of isolated system, the entropy never goes down. It's, you could say it's an observation in the real world that, that, that it's observed that, that, that entropy never goes down. But, but living underneath that observed is the laws of statistics, which again are not, they're not like the, the laws of motion, which give exact results in every possible case. The laws of statistics give predictions based on observation of many uh, repetitions of the same, of same situation. How, how likely is it that if you do this, you'll end up with that result? So if I try to move thermal energy from either box to the other, the, the, the measure of entropy, the, the measurement entropy itself will go down, which is to say that that kind of a, a thermal motion from, from two objects that are at the same temperature, such that one of them goes up in temperature, the other one goes down, that is so statistically unlikely you never observe it. Um, people, I should say, you know, physicists and, and people equivalent to physicists do go and look, watch the, watch the motion of thermal energy at sort of the atoms and molecules stage, of like individual atoms, individual molecules, and pay attention to the, to the, the, the give and take of thermal energy in, in, in the fundamentally tiny doses. And you, there you find the fluctuations, um, which way it goes. Once in a while it will go from the cold one to the hot one just spontaneously. But if you, if you back away and you look at the overall object, where there's a lot of statistics, the heat always flows from hot to cold. It just, it always. It, it's, that, that observation is equivalent to saying, like, if you play the lottery just once or 10 times, there is a chance you'll actually win. And you'll, you'll for, for a given amount of money, and you'll make a huge fluctuation where you suddenly have a tremendous payoff. But if you keep playing the lottery day after day, and the lottery may not be an example because it, may take, it might take more than a lifetime really to, to explore the statistics. But if you play some, some lesser game where, where you win every 20 times on average, you might win the first time you do it and go, wow, this is great. You know, it's, it's, it's a money-making scheme. But if you play it 1,000 or, or 10,000 or 100,000 times, you're going to have explored the statistics. You will have tried all the possibilities repeatedly, and you will find that it pays off one in 20, whatever I said initially. 
The same with uh, thermal energy. If you look at individual exchanges as thermal energy, in tiny portions, you may see fluctuations. But on the, on the, scheme of, on the scale of, of real objects, now nah, it always flows from hot to cold. Okay, and it does that because the other way would reduce entropy. It's forbidden. All right? So the thermally isolated system idea is that if you're allowed to move entropy across some boundary into, into, into another system, of course you can reduce it. Like, I'm, if, if, if you come in here with a gadget, that's that, a super cold gadget, re, my, my hand has zero temperature, zero entropy. I reach in there, the thermal energy flows right into my hand. This is great. This goes down to one, and that goes down to four, and I leave. Yeah, well, the entropy of that system dropped, but we broke the, the rules. I went in there and spoiled the thermally isolated system. I sucked some entropy out of it by sucking some thermal energy out of it. The, the, on the grand scheme of the universe, the entropy didn't go down. We just moved it. We sent it off to the garbage dump, or me. Okay? So thermally isolated system clause says that the, the draw the boundary around your system such that no entropy is, uh, no, no thermal energy is going to move across it. If you do that, you isolate your system so that whatever entropy is in it stays in it, that entropy is never going to go down. Okay? Now I'm going to put this back in here. And i got to go back up to seven. Yeah, seven and seven. Well, if I want to lower the temperature of this one, in this system, you think, well, it's impossible because you certainly can't get heat to flow from this one, to, from the left one to the right one. That's, that'll always incre uh, decrease the entropy and it's forbidden. Is there any way we can do it, do better? And it turns out there is. And here's how you do it. You come in with some ordered energy. So here's this, my, my other color. This ordered energy carries with it no, it's not, no disorder, it's perfect. It's, it's beautifully ordered stuff, therefore, I'm allowed to bring it into the thermally isolated system. It doesn't violate the rules of it for the law of entry. So if I bring it in, and I'm going to use it to pick up one unit of thermal energy from the left box and carry, so, and carry that thermal energy across to the, to the right box, and both of them are going to show up. And I'm going to actually turn the ordered energy into thermal energy and drop it into the right box. So now I've got five units of thermal energy rattling around this system, right? I brought a new unit of energy in, and it's going to become thermal. I snuck it in the door because it was ordered, and I turned it into thermal energy. Now it's trapped in here. So I put two units of thermal energy in this one, having removed one from that. So let's, what, let's do the count. We're at 14 before this, my little activity now. This guy loses one unit of thermal energy, and therefore, its entropy goes from 7 to 4. This guy, however, gets two units of thermal energy. So it goes from 2 to 4, and that gives, takes the entropy from 7 to 9 to 10. I still have 14 units of, of entropy. It's OK. The law of entropy says this is OK. I mean, normally I actually would probably go up in entropy and doing this little trick, but, but, but according to the numbers I've chosen, the entropy stayed the same. I moved heat from the cold one to the hot one and didn't decrease the entropy because I used ordered energy to do it and turned that ordered energy into disordered energy. I created more entropy, basically, to pay for the movement. The movement alone of heat from the cold, from the cold one to the from one to, to the other, making one cold and one hot. That movement alone would drop the entropy and be forbidden. Can't happen. But doing it while I created more disorder in the act activity is allowed. The law of entropy is okay with that. And that's how the air conditioner works. It works within a, a basically a thermally isolated system that you draw around the entire house and the and the environment. So. We draw it all the way around Charlottesville. We're going to air condition your room, but we're going to draw the, the thermally isolated system wall around your, the whole of Charlottesville. And we'll look and we'll watch that the air conditioner's job is, is going to be to move heat from your room and lower its entropy a lot 
to the outdoors and raise its entropy a little, and that by itself is a problem. That, that can't happen because that will lower the total entropy of Charlottesville. So what happens? The air conditioner makes some extra entropy. It does it by bringing in electricity, which, costs, which, which is allowed freely to enter the Charlottesville world. And that entropy, that, thermal, that electricity becomes thermal energy in the outdoors. So it cools your room a little while heating the outdoors a lot. More heat shows up outdoors than was removed from your room. Is that okay? And this is permitted, and you can do it. The law of, the law of entropy and the laws of thermodynamics are fine with this. And it's, what, it's done routinely. You move heat that way. Okay? So after four, four thermal energies, the ent entropy always goes up by one. Uh, now, my, my numbers, I, I'll, 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 I'll say again that my, the numbers I've chosen for this chart are, are illustrative. They're not exact. And to do things correctly, I'd have to be much more careful in picking the numbers and stuff like that. And this is close enough to, the, to reality that it works. If we keep adding thermal energy, we're going to go off the scale by some, some interesting way. And I probably, my scale, probably for fundamental reasons, isn't quite correct enough that, that we'll run into trouble if I keep going, turning it dial. Uh, I was hoping to see this, the sum of 10 plus 4. I, I wanted more than 14, because normally an air conditioner actually is a net producer of entropy, a real air conditioner. It, although it lowers the entropy of your room, it raises the entropy of the great outdoors more than it lowers the entropy of your room. So it's a net producer of entropy. In this particular example, I managed to, to make it uh, be a net nothing. It didn't produce or destroy entropy. Destroying, of course, is impossible. Creating more is much more likely than creating zero, exactly. All right? So to actually do the air conditioner, so I've talked now at, at, at length about the, the hypothetical. Let me do the real. So I, I, I told you that a, I showed you this before, I'll show you it again, that you can play with the temperature of a gas by, by, by compressing it and expanding it. There's nothing forbidden about that by the law of entropy. Um, you, you, you take things out of thermal equilibrium in, in, by doing this, but you're not dictating which way the heat's flowing. You're just, you're just changing temperatures and moving thermal energy around um, or creating, well, you're not violating any of the laws of thermodynamics. So I'm going to trap the air inside this, this jug, the temperature of which is on this bar graph. So you see the jug is at room temperature right now. The air inside is at room temperature. I'll shove that on. If I pump, compress the air in that jug, which I do with a bicycle pump, it gets hotter. That's the temperature going up. It's real. I can feel it with, actually with my hand. The air is getting hotter inside the pump. And it's not friction that's doing that. It's the act of compressing the air, which involves work, that ends up as energy in the air. And the only way the energy can, can manifest itself in a gas is as temperature, more thermal energy. So the temperature went way up. Let me, let me get it up there again. And because it's the hottest thing in the room, heat is naturally flowing from the gas into the, into the room. That's the direction that doesn't create entropy, that does create entropy. That's good. The law of, second, uh, the law of entropy is happy. Okay? So heat is flowing out of that hot air into the room. And now, if I pop the cork, <laughs> sorry. Um, look what happened to the temperature. The air that was trapped in there compressed high density, but it had already cooled somewhat towards room temperature, suddenly was able to expand. And it, in doing so, it did work on the surrounding air, on this, the room. It pushed all the room air a little bit back. It exerted a force on it for distance. It did work. And it did that using its energy. So the, the, the air that had been trapped in there that was initially hot and then was cooling off by I trapped the air in there. I got, made it hot by compressing it. The heat flowed out of it into the room, and it returned to room temperature. Then when I popped the cork, that room temperature but pressurized gas expanded. And as it did that, it used its energy to push every, all the other air out of the way. So its temperature plummeted. And it became the coldest thing in the room. And heat began to flow into it. So let me do this again, and you guys can Hopefully, you can follow the sequence. Trapped. I'm going to 
compress it, and as I do, its temperature goes up because I'm doing work on it. Now I'm going to release it. Heat's flowing out of it. It's, it's cooling down. It's cooling. It's cooling. Still cooling. Is it going to come onto the screen? I don't know. It, it's coming out. This, this, there will be heat flowing out of the bottle. Now, pop the cork, and the air expands. It pushes the air out of the way, using its energy to do work, and it gets cold. It becomes the coldest thing in the room. And we can do this cycle back and forth. And this, this is just creating the possibility of air conditioning. Let's, so, so now my, my story of, of the bottle to do it. If I want to air condition this room to make you all cooler, so it's the hot summer, what I do is I go outside with, with my bottle of trapped air and I compress it. As I do that, I do work on it. I just, I just did work on it. It's now hot, having had me do work on it. Heat's flowing out of it into the outdoor air. And I'm pretty soon I have Room, I have outdoor air temperature gas that's pressurized. It's, it's dense and compact. If I come in here to cool the, cool the room air and release it, it expanded. It did work on my hands in expanding, and it got cold. And it became the coldest thing in the room. Heat flows naturally into it. Okay? I go outside, squeeze it, gets hot. Heat flows out. Come inside, unsqueeze it, it gets cold, heat flows in. You can move heat back and forth that way. Is that okay? So the bottle's not so effective, but a syringe more effective. If I compress this, I'll show you in another day that when you compress air really tightly, you can make the temperature skyrocket, like really hot, like you can start fires with this. So I, I go out, oh, I gotta go outside. I compress it, it's got, it gets hot. I come in, decompress it, it gets cold, and back and forth. And the consequence of this is the room air will get colder, the outdoor air will get hotter, and what happens to my work? It turns out I'm doing a net amount of work in this, which is to say that out here, compressing it, I do more work compressing it here than I get back uncompressing it here. So I'm doing a net amount of work. Where's the work ending up? Outdoors. I'm actually releasing more heat out there than I, than I soaked up in here. All right? A real air conditioner, you can, you can make an air conditioner that is based on pure air, doing exactly what I'm, what I'm doing. That kind of air conditioning where, you, where you, in fact, you go back and forth. You don't physically go back and forth. You use machinery to, to move the heat from one to the other. That's how you liquefy nitrogen, incidentally. You press the bejeeb, compress the bejeebers out of air, it gets really hot, heat flows out of it. Then you decompress it dramatically, it gets really cold. And you may need sort of two stages of this process to get the job done, but you can make it get so really cold that it condenses into, li into liquid nitrogen. So that's how a liquid nitrogen uh, generator works, compressing and decompressing the air. And it lives within the laws of thermodynamics. It's, for, it's totally, totally allowed as long as it's not creating, not destroying entropy in an isolated system, and it's not. Um, the real air conditioners that you're used to working with are not, don't use just ordinary air. I mean, air, is, air would do it, but it's, it's relatively ineffective as, an, as a refrigerating material. You can do a lot better is the main point. And the way you do a lot better is that instead of working with something that remains a gas throughout your entire process, when you go out there and squeeze it, it's, it's a, it becomes a compressed gas. When you bring it in and unsqueeze it, it becomes a decompressed gas or you know, low density gas. Put in a fluid that can make the transition from liquid to gas and gas to liquid. And so ref most refrigerators, I mean, apart from ones that are doing weird things like making liquid nitrogen, they work with, with a working fluid that makes the transition from liquid to gas and gas to liquid. And it, it boosts the cooling pro power. It doesn't save you from anything in particular. It just makes the, the air conditioner um, uh, much more efficient for the, for the space and such. The, a, small, a small air conditioner based on air would, be, would barely cool a, a mouse's house. But a, the same size air conditioner built on a, on a proper working fluid would do a great job. The, the best working fluid people have ever in, 
come up with is the freons, which are, again are banned because of the ozone problem. But I'm going to use this stuff, you know, the, the so-called canned air. Well, it's not air at all. It's a, it's a chemical that undergoes the that, that evaporates easily at room temperature. In fact, it loves it. it, want, it, it yeah, it evaporates like crazy at room temperature. So it's got a boiling temperature that's quite low, um, among other things. So I'm going to put it into this container, and this, this, I can put it in as a liquid. You, you've probably done this. Right? You tip the thing upside down, and you get the liquid that's in the bottom. It's full of liquid and gas. Usually you tap the gas out of the top. But if I, if I take this, I can spray out the liquid. And the liquid's evaporating like crazy and freezing my hand. And if I, 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 I got it. I've got, oh, but now it's under great pressure. So, so you, you can see the liquid in there, right? Everybody agree? Like, like, yeah. All right. If I compress it, I'm, out, I'm outside. I'm compressing it. I'm making the gas dense. And dense gases condense easily. Right? If, you make, if you have dense steam, for example, and you expose it to a atmosphere, ordinary room temperature, it condenses into liquid water. So I'm causing that, that working fluid to turn into a liquid out here. And as it does, it releases its latent heat of, of evaporation. So not only am I getting the, not only is, is it getting hot because I'm doing work on it, it's releasing extra heat because it's condensing from gas to liquid. I come inside and I uncompress, whew, which is easier. Well, it did a huge amount of work on me in doing that, actually. And it's now evaporating, because it's now a low density gas above the liquid. And when you have a low density gas above the liquid, the rate of molecules returning has dropped. I, may, I lowered the relative humidity, basically. This is, high, this is low relative humidity. It evaporates like crazy, soaks up heat like crazy. I go outside. I compress it. Ah, this is hard. I got so much trapped. Um, I've essentially raised the relative humidity and made it condense. Lower the relative humidity. I'm letting it out too much. <laughs> okay. Squeeze, so it squeeze here, cause, turn it into a liquid. Let me stop doing this and just, it'll, just walk it through. It's, otherwise, they will, I will explode. Um, so out here, when you compress it, you're making it favor, favorable for it to turn into a liquid. You've got a dense gas. It turns into a liquid easily. Heat rush, ro roars out of this as the, as, the, as the gas condenses into a liquid. Then you go inside with it and let it evaporate. Lower the pressure, lower the density, let the liquid evaporate. And now it soaks up heat the way evaporating liquids do. It needs that energy to separate its molecules and send them off as a gas. So it soaks up its latent heat, heat of evaporation. And that's what's happening in your, in your air conditioning unit. I'll stop the game here. No, is the liquid is moving through the system and going through these two transitions into a, into a liquid in the, at the hot side where it's dumping heat and it's turning into a gas in the cold side where it's soaking up heat. This is actually a, a dehumidifier, which believe it or not, is, is just like an air conditioner, except that both sides are in your house. So it's like the air conditioner on the table, the wall air conditioner plopped on the table. It has both sides. And by itself, it moves. It does nothing interesting, is, or so it would seem. It's just moving heat from one side to the other and chewing up electricity. What it does do is it manages to, to condense water onto its cold side, get rid of the water, and then reheat the air on the hot side. So when I turn this on, just to walk you through it. It's doing what I was just doing mechanically and without anybody walking around and, and uh, fussing about that it's too hard to do anything. This, this, this is a, a complete air conditioning loop, a refrigerating loop. At what, and let me start at one point. I'll start right he, here. This little tube is carrying liquid refrigerant, liquid working fluid. Towards the, air, towards the evaporating side, the cold side, that liquid goes through a little release valve that, that drops the pressure and density. So suddenly you have that liquid in a low pressure environment. It evaporates like crazy and soaks up heat. That, that it turns into a gas. The, 
the gas goes into a compressor, which packs the molecules tightly together so that they, now they, they want to condense into a liquid, which they do over here on the condenser. So they're, they're going from a pre high pressure gas to a, a liquid at, also at high pressure, and in doing so, they release a lot of heat. So this gets hot, and then it goes through the cycle again. This gets cold. There's a net creation of entropy in this whole process, meaning there's more, uh, there's more heat being dumped outside dumped by this than soaked up by this. But you can feel them on your way out. One's getting hot, one's getting cold, all living within the laws of entropy. All right, we'll stop and uh, continue on Wednesday. <laughs>